services, home health care, respite care, and case management. And as I mentioned earlier, they stress the flexibility. Uh, for example, in County and Monroe County were able to use fund dollars for services where there wasn't a dedicated funding stream available throughout the county, especially home repairs, not necessarily for traditional things like grab bars and ramps, but also, for example, Ingham County provides roof repairs and other repairs that bring homes up to code that allow people to safely stay in their homes. Millage dollars funded expanded services, nutrition programs. Ingham, for example, expanded their Meals on Wheels program to allow breakfast and to allow weekend meals. Their millage dollars also funded services such as home health care services for people who didn't meet the surface standards for the, for example, in Monroe, the Area Agency on Aging, they uh, are obligated to provide services to folks with the most intense needs. And Monroe used some of the millage dollars to provide some home health care services to people who didn't meet those eligibility requirements. And also, some counties, Kalamazoo, especially use the millage dollars to meet the needs of high need individuals who were on waiting lists. For example, if you've heard of the Medicaid waiver, that's when Medicaid will fund home-based services to provide, prevent nursing home placement, but they're not always eligible slots, um, spaces for, for folks who need those. The four counties we talked to emphasize the importance of collecting data, both to the county commissions use that data to decide whether a millage was necessary to seek a millage in, in three cases or Monroe had an existing senior millage, but significantly increased the number of mills. But they also use that data ongoing and collected the data ongoing to help establish priorities in the distribution of millage funds. As I said, they, one data source was um, needs assessment usually provided by the Air Agency on Aging. Another specific one was the actual wait list by nonprofit providers. Some counties also held listening sessions or town halls to try to um, give the opportunity for older adults in their county to identify possible needs and unmet services. We also heard the message from everyone, listen to the people in the field, listen to the providers who deal with unmet needs day to day and take that into account. Because it was clear that um, providing this data is the first step in any decision-making process. So we do propose that uh, our commission develop and submit a report that specifically identifies needed services by compiling the data by existing county needs assessment and waitlist, we stress that because all four counties said that the waitlist information was very important to their county commissions in decision-making, supplemented by the experience of providers, particularly those uh, participating in the Healthy Aging Collaborative in Washtenaw County, we already have a mechanism that has been discussing of providers who've been discussing and identifying needs. And we feel the data should specifically address the needs that all four counties uh, had identified. Transportation, nutrition, home health care, respite care, case management, and other services that uh, might be unique to our county. So Ellen, uh, as our other member here, do you have anything you would like 
to add? Ellen, you're on mute. Um, I think you were very comprehensive. Um, I just want to stress again that um, all four were pretty clear about collecting the data, the information uh, about what's needed and, and certainly the wait lists and prioritizing. Um, the other thing that um, I think we, they talked about was keep, not only keeping that up to date, which Elizabeth said, because then they can make decisions about distribution and how the money goes, but then they had a handle on what was going on. And I wanted to emphasize that. Um, and I, I think it was a great report. Thank you. Um, uh, well, you ha helped write it, so, Ellen, so yes, it was a great report. Does anybody have any questions? I do. I do. I have one. Okay, go, Bonnie. Yes, do you guys have um, a kind of a timeline going forward on your report um, on your, you know, that, that you had there on your pro proposal for further actions? Get an idea that, about how long that will be? That's our recommendation to the whole commission. And I defer to Marta and uh, the commission for further discussion of that. Okay, um, I see that Stephen has his hand raised. Before I call on him, I just wanna point out also that um, after Gary resigned and I got elected chair, I joined this committee and also Stephen is joining that committee. So I think we're gonna be a committee of four at this point, subcommittee. Stephen, did you have a question or comment? Um, yeah, I mean, so I think the only thing I wanted to mention when you mentioned home yeah. health care, that home health care has many different um, meanings to people. So for example, there is skilled home care, which is covered by Medicare, usually after hospitalization, but not necessarily. And so I think whenever we come up with our language, we'll want to distinguish because I think we wouldn't want to cover what Medicare covers. I think what you're speaking to more is private duty, um, mm -hmm. you know, sort of um, caregiving responsibility, formal caregiving responsibilities that isn't covered by, um, by Medicare, um, I think. I mean, the yes, alternative very... would be is if, if it's uncovered by me Medicare, be, then potentially even nursing could be paid, but um, I think you're pretty much talking about caregiving responsibility. So we we'll wanna make that clear. Yes, that's a very good point. Um, and all of the um, counties we talked to made the point that the millage funding did not supplant any yeah. existing funding, um, but was an addition to provide necessary funding. And definitely they spoke of home health care in that very broad definition. Yeah, and, and I think in Elizabeth, as you were saying, the fact that part of the responsibility for whether it's a village committee or whoever, that we do understand what funding is available so that we we are like, we don't we don't want to supplant area on aging, you know, area on aging older Americans act funding. We want to complement it because of the way it's et cetera. But there's lots of different types of funding. So of course we want to take advantage of all of those. Yeah, I agree with you, Elizabeth. So I see hands up from uh, Dina, Bonnie, and then Marie. So I'll call on Dina first. Thanks. Um, this, this could be a question for Elizabeth or maybe for the whole group, but is the report that you're recommending um, different than the needs assessment um, that was referenced at the last uh, commission meeting? And it, it sounds like these are two, these maybe need to be one in the same. And I'm, I'm just curious if there's a plan to approach this sort of from a comprehensive view. Uh, we were thinking it was one report by the commission, but again, I'll defer to Marta in terms of uh, discussing that. I think we're talking about producing a needs assessment report. Yes, as an entire commission. But yeah. is that gonna is that meant to encompass um, the report that Elizabeth that that committee is recommending? Of 
course. That is the needs, the same report. It's not okay. a separate report. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And, and I, I do think that some of what they um, have reported out overlaps with some of the things that have already been discussed about being in the needs assessment, but not everything. So we wanna make sure that we make it all one part of one entire unit. Okay, Bonnie, Marie, and then I see Stephen's hand. Um, just a little housekeeping. While we're going through the subcommittee reports today, I am updating the membership under each subcommittee as you report out and also noting who the chair is. So on the potential millage, I believe I have the membership now as often Thompson, um, Marta and Steven, is that correct? And do you have a chair? I believe I'm the chair. All right, my job is done on this one, all right. She got elected by unanimous consent, I might add. <laughs> Do the short straw, did you? Yeah, she didn't run in time. Um, okay, Marie, you have your hand up. Yeah, uh, a suggestion for, uh, as you're moving forward, Washtenaw County does have a say yes to seniors millage group that is meeting and active. Um, and so I would recommend talking with them, seeing where they're at and um, checking in about, I don't know, just how we can be working together in a direction um, that makes the most sense. I'd like to share a little bit about what we discovered when we talked to the four uh, counties. They um, made a big point that in each of their um, process of the county commissioners developing a millage proposal and um, bringing that to the voters, that there was a big distinction between uh, advocacy groups and um, each of the counties had an advocacy group in, I know in Kalamazoo it existed ahead of time. I cannot for the life of me remember exactly. I think it's Kalamazoo Advocates for Seniors. I could have that wrong, for example. But the process of developing a uh, report provided to the county commissioners um, was separate from their decision to proceed um, and separate from the advocacy um, element. Um, and I would just say that that seemed to be what was what they said was successful. So um, I think um, we might want to focus on what can be, what their advice was in their process was focusing on providing data and allowing um, advocacy groups to um, do what they do, which is advocate and work with communities. Ellen, do you have anything you'd like to add to my perception on that. And again, you're on mute. I have a um, finger problem. So using my yeah. hand is problem, I'm sorry. Um, it, it was very clear and um, that the commission was a commission to look at, 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 at older adult issues. And that once they gave it to the counties to make decisions, they before they did that, they had an advocacy group for that particular issue. And then a campaign or they, they, they put the two together. But the commission was for many issues, not just a millage. Am I correct, Elizabeth? Am I on? Yeah, and and they and drew a, a distinction, a clear distinction between the commission looking at needs and um, all the needs of the county, and um, some of the commissions were involved 
after a millage increase was passed um, and um, some decision making of how dollars were allocated. Um, but it was a, seen as a separate kind of function, I guess is my the best way I could put it. A clarification, are they talking about parallel work or complementary work? I guess I, I would say that really um, their commissions um, felt that it seemed to identify their role as um, providing information to county commissioners who then made their decisions about um, whether to move forward with the millage and the advocacy groups operated as the way any advocacy group would on any issue um, working with county commissioners. So I guess I would say both in terms of timing. I'm sure they, they were working with their county commissioners and parallel in the sense that they were kind of two separate functions, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. I think that's probably why we called this committee the Potential Millage Committee, because right. we weren't at that time and we may not still be ready to say one way or the other what we think. Uh, Stephen, you want to go next? Um, yeah, I think a couple of things. One is I'm, I'm sort of on a different, as a new member, I'm on a different page in regards to um, adding a member of the community, at least one, um, and including a member of that, say, saying yes to seniors. I think they've been working on it for so long. And I, I would say, instead, you know, I don't think of them as an advocacy group, though I need more information. I just know that it's a group of service providers. And I think as Marie had mentioned last week, I think getting the insights from service providers and it not, you know, um, only being members of the commission seem really important for us to have more grassroots insights. And so I, my recommendation would be actually to include a member of say yes to seniors on the group and, and um, you know, the other, other member that I think about is um, maybe someone like Chris Lemon from Ann Arbor Community Foundation, because there is a significant amount of dollars that are coming out of the Glacier Legacy Fund. And so I think we want to think about that in our mix as we start thinking about a millage and what, what will they offer to older adults so there's not redundancy. So those I are- think I think we already have, thanks to Dina, and the Healthy Aging Collaborative, we have that provider input. We're fortunate that there's been a group working <clears throat> on it already um, that I think um, just as, as we've been hearing from the past, that's why we included in our recommendation, make a point of work as we've talked about um, coming up with a report all that wonderful information that the hate healthy. I, I have only had one cup of coffee this morning and that's my excuse, but I'm sticking with it. The Healthy Aging Collaborative of all those providers has already provided in uh, more um, telling the stories which they've told us in their report about the unmet needs, I am confident we can reach out to those providers to get some of the specific things about waiting lists and some specific statements. I would also um, think that um, I would not want to start adding um, members of the public right now and so on and tra transition uh, into a planning role because I don't really think that's our role. Jason said very clearly as county commissioner, I as a county commissioner want data that we county commissioners can then take and move forward in our planning. And I think that, that that's our first step 
and other uh, actions might be down the road, but I heard him say very clearly, and it was clear from what the counties we talked to said, that that was the absolute key first step is providing that data. And I, Elizabeth, I, I, think oh, go ahead, I think the decision about the subcommittee membership should be left to a subcommittee discussion rather than hashing it out with the entire yeah. commission. So I think, can we defer that Stephen to the next meeting of the subcommittee? Sure, I, I, the only thing that I would say for the commission as a whole, I'm wondering whether it's not a value to have maybe even at the next um, commission on aging meeting, someone from the, the say yes to seniors speak to the whole commission about what they have and have not done up until now. I think, I think it's just too much work. It sounds like that's been done by that group for not the commission to, to hear about it, you know? Okay, um, I see that Margaret has had her hand up for a really long time. So she's, she gets to be next. And then Dina and then Ellen. Thank you. Um, well, I'm feeling a sense of urgency, um, particularly related to um, a millage. And <clears throat> so I, and I'm um, kind of in support of Steve's last comment is that um, I think it's fine for the subcommittee to talk to say yes to seniors, but I think we need to be working with them sooner rather than later. And um, so I would, I, I really want to hear from them. I think they've regenerated their committee and are working quickly. Um, and I don't want us to lose out on what they're doing. Um, the other thing I might just add is that we've asked Chris Lemon to join um, the data group, data domain group, and he has agreed to join us. Um, so um, I think we'll get quite a bit of information from him. Yeah, and I don't think this is going to drop. I think we're going to move. I'm sure the potential millage committee will be meeting soon. Okay, I see Dina is next, then Ellen, then Bennett. Just wanted to follow up to um, um, Stephen, what you were saying, and Elizabeth, your your comments. I think that there is enough overlap between the Healthy Aging Collaborative and the Say Yes to Seniors that working with our collaborative is going to give you that scope of uh, that perspective that you're looking for. Plus, I would say that because we're we are. Uh, set up by our domains, I hope that we're offering a more comprehensive view. You know, for instance, uh, Allison Foreman is on the, from Ypsilanti Meals on Wheels, is on the Say Yes to Seniors uh, group, uh, which um, she's got, she has a lot of valuable information, but we, you know, on this, on the collaborative, our um, food nutrition domain is, is led by a representative from OCED, who, you know, can, you know, hopefully, you know, speak to the landscape of food across the county. So I, I think that, um, Elizabeth, your, your instinct, I think, is, is supported that the collaborative can provide a lot of those details that, that you're looking for. And to respond, Margaret, to your sense of urgency, I hear that. And I think that's where our subcommittee was going with its recommendation is to push along the process, which I know has already been being worked on. And the data collection subcommittee has been working hard to come up with that material to provide to the commission because we do see that as, as a key step. Okay, um, I think we need to kind of move along, but I see Ellen and then Bennett, and then I think we need to move to the next subcommittee or we'll be here until tomorrow. I lowered my hand. Okay, cool. Okay, <laughs> well, um, I, uh, Marta, I am an advocacy group, or I should say the um, pandemic endemic um, <clears throat> COVID, if you will, population. Uh, is a um, <clears throat> um, 
I haven't had my coffee this morning. That's my excuse. Um, <laughs> uh, it's a subcommittee that is an advocacy group. Um, I am working with the opera uh, group and with the data uh, um, committee as well. Okay, so I see my role pretty much as a, um, a centerpiece uh, for um, research and uh, study and knowledge and ultimately of doing something about it. I live uh, in a 120 uh, member senior community and uh, there is um, much to be learned uh, with regard to the course of the uh, COVID and um, the disease, hospitalization, and certainly last but not least, social isolation. Um, I, <clears throat> during the last week, um, I basically was um, trying to get into contact uh, with some other uh, advocacy groups, one of which, uh, and most important, of which is Center for Independent Living. And um, they really um, surprised me. I had a lengthy conversation with Bill Purvis, who is uh, in fact, I believe the director of a um, group within, and um, they uh, have received a grant, um, I believe from Chris Lemon's, um, uh, if you will, foundation, and uh, he has offered to come and speak before um, the commission. And he is articulate and very able has, and has much to learn. Um, once again, his name is William Purvis. I don't know whether any of you have uh, interacted with him in the past. I did speak with Amanda Sears uh, regarding yes to, um, say yes to seniors, and I'm sure we will be working together. So uh, during, um, uh, regarding uh, the status uh, uh, in uh, Lurie Terrace, which is the 120 member senior community, we remain in lockdown. Lockdown, as you can pretty much uh, intuit, is not a very uh, nice situation. Um, and we all know that the surge has abated. Um, right now, the number of COVID infections is down to where they were um, in um, roughly September. Um, and uh, everything is uh, fine, except for the positivity rate. The positivity rate is 5%. And apparently the Housing um, Commission of Ann Arbor uh, thinks that's too low. And um, I, I concur, they're not very much interested in my opinions on that. But what lockdown means, and this is something that you should all know and to some extent empathize with, that we are not allowed to eat in commons area. Okay, and that is the significant social component for uh, Lurie Terrace. Why? Because many, if not most, of the residents here are not ambulatory or not easily ambulatory. And beyond that, um, many of them are too frightened to leave their apartments. So everyone is masked or supposed to be and you have this big community of being effectively in lockdown. Now, no one stops you from going out, uh, either out of your apartment, as long as you're masked, and indeed out of the complex, but most do not do that. Um, so um, that is uh, the story there. Um, Bennett, could I just interrupt you for a second? Is, is this pretty much your subcommittee report then? Is that- Okay, no, this right is now? my subcommittee report. Okay. And I, uh, as a advocacy group or a consumer advocacy group, okay. 
have wanted to touch base. One additional uh, matter. We all got <clears throat> last Friday or Saturday, we, <clears throat> it seems as though every apartment received a statement from uh, the city council of Ann Arbor saying they wanted us to comment on uh, the allocations, or if you will, the tentative allocations made uh, <clears throat> via the opera um, rescue plan. Um, and they, uh, there were 13 projects listed that were on their uh, plan with what a week to go. And my guess is that week has transpired and of those projects, none of them uh, dealt directly with um, COVID um, cases uh, and or the aged, okay, particularly the aged and the vulnerability. And um, I was quite uh, disconcerted about that and uh, wrote something. Uh, they asked us to write something, which I did, and it was submitted. I um, also um, inquired as, oh, and I made several phone calls to the link that was mentioned in this flyer, but, <clears throat> um, and I have no idea what happened with that. Um, I did offer to speak at the um, council meeting, um, which was going on, um, I guess sometime the middle of last week. And I was the fifth speaker, but they do not have Zoom. They only have an, a smartphone connection. And um, <clears throat> I got lost in the technology of using a smartphone in place of uh, Zoom. And so I never uh, succeed in contacting them in, a, uh, in the public meeting. I would have addressed myself as a resident um, and not as a member of the commission. I did phone, however, my uh, council woman, Erica Briggs, and uh, that was a cordial meeting, informative, but <clears throat> she knew nothing about um, the, uh, the allocation made uh, for opera. She said that she would get back to me. I will likely call her uh, today after the meeting. So, I mean, the, um, the county is in good shape generally uh, because the surge is over. But the reason why many of us call it an endemic is because we already have had three, um, if you will, surges and um, many people, epidemiologists believe that that is the future. We will have another surge and then there will be a letdown, if you will. Uh, so one should not get too optimistic that the period we're living in is over. So, okay, um, I am on two other committees and um, I guess they will speak for them cells with me as being a part of it. Thank you. So Bennett, can I just ask then, do you have additional things for the pandemic endemic subcommittee meeting or was that pretty much what you had to offer? Yeah, there? as far mm -hmm. as I know, by the way, I am the only member of the pandemic endemic committee. And um, I guess um, what um, Bonnie will say will speak for, um, the work that I am uh, jointly doing. So this is the only thing regarding the pandemic endemic subcommittee. And is your subcommittee then teaming up with another subcommittee at this point? I think I heard that. Well, I, I yeah, I guess that is to be determined. I mean, I think that I always will have advocacy work, um, whether it is with um, Bruce uh, Purvis or whatever. So um, it's to be determined. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have anything before we move ahead? All right, um, let's do domains next, Marie. Uh, 
Thank you. So on the domain subcommittee, we currently have myself, uh, Margie, and Bennett. Um, some of the things that we discussed were what community members can we be adding to our uh, subcommittee, service providers, stakeholders, et cetera. We identified Chris Lemon, reached out to him, and he's going to start meeting with us as well. Um, we're, we talked about um, reviewing the data provided by the HAC. I have a meeting with Dina about that uh, coming up. Reviewing the needs of the Millage Subcommittee and then taking um, their wonderful report today with what we're learning from the HAC based on those we want to start drafting that needs assessment, um, put it together and uh, have it for the entire group to, to see, to comment on, uh, critique, et cetera. That, that's one of our, our main goals coming up. There's some other domains that we uh, started talking about exploring, long-term care data rehabilit or rehabilitation data, homebound data, um, we did talk with Bennett about the potential of the pandemic endemic joining the domain subcommittee, um, what we would do with that approach um, that we explained to him too is to look at some of these domains pre-pandemic 2019 at the onset of the pandemic and then what it looks like now to kind of paint, paint that picture for the domain and also COVID's impact. We talked about some infrastructure areas that we would like to look at, uh, service access, referral systems. Um, we talked about the county service load, so how the county may be referring out to other organizations to do work because the county itself is at capacity, um, looking at some of those areas. Uh, the other thing we talked about is um, also absorbing the data and survey committee. Uh, currently, that's Bonnie and myself. We felt like the, the work that we wait to do is either based on the H waiting on the HAC um, or waiting for the domain committee to, to have a request. And so if we were to combine those, we could be more efficient. Um, and so that is a proposal that we were going to make and put up for discussion. And that looks like all we have to report right now. Okay, I see two hands up, uh, Bennett and then Stephen or Bennett, did you just forget to take your hand down? Oh, I just forgot. Okay, cool. All right, then Stephen. Uh, you know, I just want to say I'm glad that the committee is looking at nursing home care. Um, you know, it's interesting. My uh, good friend of mine's mother has to go into a nursing home after a hospital stay. And so I was reviewing the public data on it. And um, the, there's a bunch of facilities. Well, not a bunch, but there's some facilities that can't, um, that are on probation from the government. Um, there's the highest rated place had five stars, but yet um, one out of um, four people went back to the hospital within 30 days. And if you had ER, one out of three people either went to the hospital or ER, and that's the five star facility. So I think it really needs attention, both in uh, understanding more, get, getting more insights to allow the public to make informed decisions at a crisis moment in their lives. And then I also have heard about assisted living from other friends and the poor state that it's in. And yet there's really no understanding of what's going inside those places. So I hope that that also is something to think about in regards to how do we get satisfaction, standardized satisfaction surveys out so people can make good decisions about assisted living. And then finally, um, I have experience with HUD housing and bringing you know, we brought nurse practitioners into HUD housing. And one of the things we saw was the sad um, moments when people in HUD housing wound up getting frailer. And instead of bringing support into the housing, they were basically told they had to leave. And so I'm hoping that you'll, you know, sort of look at that, that moment in time and how we're doing supportive housing, especially for those who, who don't have the ability to pay. 
Okay, um, thanks, Stephen. Um, I see Elizabeth and then Bonnie. Um, the thing phrase just uh, flashed into my brain if you're Tolkien fans, one ring to bind them all. And I sort of thought <laughs> we've really got one report, one data to bind mm -hmm. them all. And so I think uh, Marie's suggestion of bringing the data survey report together with the other subcommittees makes lots of sense. Cause I think we're really, it seems to me talking about the same thing, putting together everything we've got at the moment and can get into um, uh, a report that can be shared with the county commissioners. Okay, um, Bonnie? Yeah, a little, I just want to talk a little bit about the survey and data analysis since Marie brought up about the merging. It originally was created because we thought at the time, because we were brand new, that we would be sending out our own surveys and we would be collecting our own data. And then it, I mean, that's kind of how this originally um, was created. And it's been on pause because we quickly learned we have a lot of of um, other organizations that have already been gathering data, have been you know compiling data. So we kind of put a pin on that waiting till we found out. And as Marie said, her and I are the only ones that are on this committee and I fully support merging it into the main uh, domain, I, it's called main uh, you know, domain identification right now is on the, uh, what, what was referred to on our um, report that we sent out. So that would be my report for the survey and data analysis that we merge it into there. And I think it can be much more productive and get everybody you know, working on the same direction to get this report done, gather data. And that also that's gonna greatly impact um, the ARPA. That's um, my report that I'm gonna do. And I'll explain that when I, have, when I have the floor to talk about that. But so that's what I would recommend doing right now. So. Again, housekeeping, I'm trying to get a handle on who is um, on this um, domain subcommittee, um, Marie. So I would like to join it. So I'd like my name added. So that would make the current members, uh, then is it, would the current members be Bennett, Margie, Marie, and me? Yep. Okay. All right, excellent. Um, the, the next subcommittee up is communications. Marie, did you have anything to, to put into that, give to report on that? Yeah, um, so currently that's myself, Bonnie and Marta. We uh, were talking about this, the, the issue that some of the community members had trying to get the information for our last meeting. Um, we confirmed that there is a listserv, so you community members listening, there is a listserv registration on our Washtenaw County Commission on Aging website. If you go to that page and scroll down to like right under the second paragraph or something, there's a place for interested parties, and that's where you would register. Um, also, uh, the link to our meetings continues to be on our agendas. A few other things we decided to add to the agendas as well to make them a, a better communication tool. There's um, our website right on the agenda with the sign up reminder for community members. And then if you look at the bottom of our agendas now, we do have our charge from the Board of Commissioners, our, our mission statement, if you will, on each agenda to remind us and, and keep us um, really focused and on track as we do our meetings. So that was a, a communication piece. Uh, when Gary was serving as chair, he was receiving all of the website communications from community members. Um, and now that will be Marta and Mar as chair, uh, Marta will take that on. And then as needed, she might pass on these communications to any of the members who makes the most sense if you're chairing a subcommittee that they're asking about. Um, one of the officers, things of that nature. Um, let's see. And the last thing we wanted to talk about was just um, as we're communicating with the public, as we're communicating with our board of commissioner representative, um, 
We just want to keep good communication practices in mind. Uh, we're more than happy to make scripts for anybody like we did in the past for reaching out to your commissioner and, and building rapport. Um, but we do also ask that you um, really, uh, what did I write down? Oh, we put it in um, the guidelines that we're gonna discuss later, a few recommendations on how to just make sure that we're communicating appropriately as a commissioner to public um, and other entities. Are there any questions? I see two hands so far. I see Bonnie and then I oh, see- Oh, I'm sorry, Bonnie, I took your hand down. And I see Elizabeth after that. So yeah. Bonnie? No, I took, I took mine down, I'm fine. Okay, cool, Stephen? Yeah, um, Marie, I think uh, I'm still a little disconcerted by the relatively low attendance at these meetings, especially <laughs> as we start talking about millage and ARPA funds. And so I guess I, I just feel like we should be more proactive in, at the very least, making sure that providers know and making sure that advocacy groups and others that um, relate to older adults um, are aware that this, you know, these meetings are happening and that they do have the ability to ask questions and have input. So I, I just would hope you think about that you now, whether it's ARP, whether it's, you know, I don't know, NAMI, you know, just tr really trying to, the churches, you know, thinking about where older people might go for information and um, so that we get a lot more community involvement and recognition. You know, I just think that now that we're talking about potentially having a role in how dollars are spent, I would think that more people would be interested in, in knowing what's going on. And, and so nine people as attendees seems like it's, it's really low considering how many people, you know, care about older adults and interact with older adults. Yeah, I would encourage, um, so noted communications committee uh, notes that, thank you for the recommendation. And I would also recommend you and, and all the commissioners to be reaching out to your networks, any aging groups that you're a part of um, and reminding them that we're meeting, give them our agenda so they can click the join link really easy, um, send them the interested parties so they get the reminders, um, all, of, all of that good stuff. Um, please, please help do that because I mean, communications, we're, we're uh, volunteering our time too for, for those things. So anything that we can do as a collaborative is, is really helpful in getting the word out. Yeah, so I think, I mean, Deanna, I think, you know, um, that, I mean, I, I'm hoping every one of the people in Healthy Aging Collaborative is, you know, is sort of has been formally told about this, about the listserv. Um, you know, same thing. I see Amanda Sears is on that say yes to seniors. And then I think, you know, Bennett, we have to think about how do we get um, older adults more knowledgeable about this and the advocacy groups for older adults. Well, I might just, uh, I guess, forward a, uh, a judgment that uh, basically uh, the aging community, at least to the extent that I'm aware of it here, has not been very uh, effective. And uh, so I dare say we have a difficult job to do and I am a member of that community. Um, and um, so I am just um, advancing that as a challenge. I think it might not be a bad idea to start tracking the number of audience members that show up at our meetings to see if we're making progress. So I would suggest as a communications committee member that we start doing that. Uh, Elizabeth and then Dina. I would thank you to the communications committee for doing so much to make things available. Although we'd like um, to have everyone in the county <laughs> attending these meetings, I think. Um, I have to say from my personal experience on working on a whole variety of government commissions and committees over the years that actually, I think uh, we've done a great job of letting the provider community know that we exist and also on getting people listening to our meetings and participating. But I'd just like to pick up on a comment Bennett had made earlier talking about when he 
was talking to people, he said, in my role as a resident of Fleury Terrace, I did some communications and I think it is so helpful that the communications committee can provide a script for when we're speaking as commissioners. And also I need to remind myself and I'd urge other people to think about being careful about distinguishing when you're representing the commission and when you're speaking from your own personal viewpoint and experience, because we all have such a rich body of experience. Okay, uh, Dina. Um, yes, I just um, just wanted to suggest. So, Marie, um, since you typically attend the, the collaborative meeting, if you're going to be there next at next week's meeting, we can put you know five minutes on the agenda it, for you just to reiterate how um, how our group can um, get on the listserv where they can find the agenda and so Definitely. forth. That'd be good. We also have a through the Washington Health Initiative which is kind of our umbrella over the collaborative. We also have a monthly uh, newsletter. So I am I'm happy to put information in that newsletter uh, if that's something that the commission wants. And I would just need like the specific blurb that, that you want in there. Um, and, you know, I, th I think, you know, it's important to make sure that the link for the meeting information is available with that, that blurb because, um, one of the, you know, I think sometimes one of the limiting factors is looking for an agenda and then looking for the link on the agenda. So the, the, I think the more easier you can make the link information available and prominent, mm -hmm. you know, might be able to get more people attending. Excellent. Okay, Stephen, did you just forget to raise your No, no, I actually do have another comment. I think, you know, we talked about diversity for members of the commission or, or commission on aging. I also think we should think about the diversity of the listening attendees and how we can um, be specific about um, getting, you know, a more diversified attending group and work especially hard in making sure that underrepresented parts of our community are, are involved and, you know, African-American, Hispanic community, um, you know, LGBT community, you know, just thinking about different, you know, populations of people that, that have a voice that we got to, we have to make sure that, you know, we're listening to. And so any outreach we can make that will be especially bringing those who can give some input. I think um, I, would, I would tend to prioritize that group. Okay, thank you, Bonnie. And then uh, Margaret after that. Um, Dina kind of triggered something that I had been thinking about before. And since we're talking about this, we'll just bring it up to everybody. Um, one of the things that we haven't done is not only, like Dina mentions, that she has a newsletter. I receive two monthly newsletters, one from the Milan Senior Center and one from the Pittsfield Senior Center. And I also get communications from the Turner Senior Center. Now, we have not done a public, um, a formal announcement, you know, um, introducing ourselves to the senior community providing easy links for them to find. Um, so I would put it out there, is that an avenue that we want to be able to do? Now, if you all have uh, other newsletters or senior organizations that you participate in and they regularly send out like a monthly announcement that we could ask you know, to put something in, I think that would be another good outreach because I know that Pittsfield Senior Newsletter goes everywhere not only just in our county, but there are members, you know, um, way outside, uh, I mean, other states that also participate in that newsletter. So it's a good outreach. Um, if that is something that everybody thinks is worthwhile doing, um, if you, I know Marita is super busy. So if you want to send me um, the name of the organization, their contact person, you know, or, or newsletter link or whatever you have, you can send to me and I'll start compiling those. And then I'll work with Marie to draft something that we can put in those newsletters mm -hmm. and bring it to the commission to get it approved before we do it. Does that sound like a good plan for a good outreach? I think it sounds great. Yeah. Sound good? All right, so I need all you guys to send me something and then we'll compile it and we'll put a letter together, me and Marie, and, and we'll bring it back to the, to the commission and then we'll send it out, okay? 
Okay, perfect. Okay, so I have an order now, Margaret, Bennett, and then Stephen. Um, yes, I was just going to ask Dina how we can get a copy of your newsletter. Oh, it's really easy. I can send you the link um, on the website to sign up um, for it if you want to get it, or um, it's available, um, I believe, on our on on the WHI website. So, um, so that's easy to do. And then, as far as getting information into the newsletter, you could just send that to me. Um, Why don't you send that link to Stephanie, and she can send it to all of us, so we can yeah, all sign up for the newsletter. That'd be great. Thank you. Yep. Okay, Bennett and then Stephen. Yeah, okay. My efforts, preliminary as they have been, seems to be totally uh, disconcerting when dealing with the city council. Um, is there a proverbial wall between uh, the way the county functions in outreach uh, on behalf of COVID and the aged and the city council? What is your experience, if indeed you have one? or any with dealing with the city council. The, uh, the older woman wasn't aware of anything. Uh, I'm, I won't mention her name again. Um, and um, again, uh, 13 out of the, the 13 projects that they were um, working on, and I imagine consummate, consummated that work with the first deadline, uh, didn't mention anything significantly uh, dealing with COVID and the aging. I'm not sure that's within our jurisdiction, but I think it's certainly something that can be discussed and figure out where we might go with that. So with that, when you say jurisdiction, the county doesn't really collaborate in informal or formal uh, ways with the city council. I don't know if any of us could possibly know that since we don't. It might be a question to ask Jason, but I I wouldn't know officially or unofficial channels that way. Okay, that when Peter, you think of it, Peter has his hand up, and he probably could answer that question. Peter, would you jump in real quick? Yeah. So just a, a really quick answer, and it's obviously pretty nuanced and specific because everyone has their existing relationships. There's definitely conversations that happen frequently between city and county employees and staff and commissioners, um, as is the case with all local jurisdictions. So Ypsilanti Township to uh, Manchester Village, like there's definitely a, a communication <laughs> line between the county and those uh, jurisdictions, um, even though like when it comes to uh, decision making and like what everyone has their own authority over, those are pretty unique. But um, uh, in general, there is a line of communication. I think it can always be improved. Uh, but but there is like informal work going on. And in some cases, formal work going on. Uh, but in other areas, there's not as much conversation. Um, so I, I definitely think that uh, while it's not necessarily the county's jurisdiction to work with all of these agencies, it's important that there's like a good working relationship there. Uh, okay, well, I mean, it is incongruous that we at Lurie Terrace, there are again about 120 members are run and owned by the uh, um, Ann Arbor, you know, um, Housing Commission. And there is no good linkage that I'm aware of. So. Um, with the city council. And that's something that I will see what I can do with, what I can do. Okay, got it, thank you. Thank you, Bennett. Uh, Stephen, and then we're gonna yeah. move ahead. Yeah, I just uh, want to the, Ani had sort of um, reminded me of a couple of things. I think one is, I, um, and I'll, I'll send um, Marie this, but I, I think that there are so many strong gerontology programs it, within Washtenaw County, you know, at EMU, Washtenaw County, you know, um, you know, Washtenaw Community College, um, you know, of course, University of Michigan, and that we really want to think about, you know, whether it's geriatricians or social work or, you know, gerontology nursing, um, and then also thinking about, you mentioned Turner Clinic, like there's a program, OLLI, which has older adults who take courses, um, that seems like a natural place. Um, Washington, County, Washington Community College, if I understand correctly, you could take courses as an older adult. You know, just 
thinking about, you know, where are there places that might have mailing lists that we could get the word out. So I'll, I'll send you everything I could think of, Marie, but just wanted to continue to, you know, think about how we could um, impact our reach. Thank you. Okay, um, we're gonna go to the last subcommittee, which is ARPA, and that would be Bonnie. All right, all of you should have received our, our um, attachment um, that Stephanie sent out. Um, the ARPA subcommittee, um, I'm at it. I'm the chair uh, with, um, since Gary has resigned, the members are Bennett and Stephen, and we have a community member, Sarah Hung. And um, I just wanna do a brief follow-up from our last meeting um, that Marta requested that we bring to you the information on the funding guidelines before we start. The federal guidelines for ARPA funds is they have to be allocated by December 31st, 2024, fully imp implemented by 12-31-26. That's the federal guidelines because there was questions on the last meeting, what about May, we're hearing May, you know, what, what's going on? So I asked about the Washtenaw County Board of Commissioners ARPA funds timeline, if they have one, and there is no specifically defined timeline. However, there's a pattern timeline. So the first round of allocations were approved, then it was about 45 to 60 days after that first initial approval before the second round opened up. Now, the second round was just approved um, Wednesday. So that was approved on March 2nd. So we're anticipating it's gonna be another 45 to 60 days before they open up for asking for third round. So that will give us a target date of mid-April to early May that we could expect that they would be coming back out, the county would be coming out and asking for third round proposals. So that's, Hopefully that information satisfies what you guys wanted to know last week. Now our report, um, what ARPA has been, our subcommittee has been doing, we met twice in February and we had discussions on understanding the guidelines, the fast approaching deadline for third round uh, fund proposals and what's the best option that we as the Commission on Aging could take to help secure fund allocations to support countywide programs. And during our first meeting, Peter walked us through the ARPA proposal history, timelines, how you submit your, uh, your process. And then we had some pretty good discussions, including at the second uh, meeting as well with Bennett and um, Stephen joining the subcommittee. And we came um, to the conclusion um, as a subcommittee that our best shot would be to create um, a proposal very similar to the one that just was approved, which is called the Community Priority Fund. It has an $8 million budget for allocation. And what we would like to use today is a working title called the Senior Programs Priority Fund. And this would be a fund that would support senior specific programs and it would have the flexibility to support requests from very small organizations, grassroots organizations, up to a larger collaborative request that maybe multiple organizations would submit. And it would help provide an opportunity to support organizations all across Washtenaw County and help equalize service disparities for senior services and providers. Now to create our proposal that we would bring back to the committee as a whole, we would rely heavily on the other subcommittee work that's being done right now for strong and compelling language demonstrating the impact of the pandemic and endemic on senior citizens. One of the part of ARPA funds is you have to have a strong case that you know it has to be COVID related. And I think if any sector of the uh, population, the senior, ought to be able to make that case that COVID had a very strong, devastating impact on our community and the request for funding. The other one would be from the needs and assessment report that we're talking about. We would pull heavily from that because you have to show needs and assessments. Also our gaps in services. And um, we'd also ask for help defining the quality and quantifying the categories in the 
um, community priority, you, I hope everyone received that or has read that article. They have five very distinctive kind of buckets of funding or proposals that they're looking for. And we would do something very similar to that, only it would be very senior specific type things. Um, so we would use the approved community fund priority structure um, to define the process for how to allocate the ARPA funds, how the, we would receive proposals from the county, um, that county staff would first vet all the proposals coming in for ARPA compliance. In the um, community fund, they have a 11 member oversight committee that will be ranking and reviewing these funds. And guess what? We're an 11 member committee already set up and we represent every single district in Washtenaw County. We have a member at large and we also have a, a um, board of commissioner member on our panel. So our proposal would say that the Commission on Aging would act as this agency to, for um, reviewing the proposals. And then after we review it, then there's a whole process for sending it back up to the Board of Commissioners, and then they make the review, and then it comes back down the Oversight Committee. So all the major structure of how this would function has already been submitted to the County Board of Commissioners, and it has been approved. So we would use that structure and it would just have a senior, um, um, senior needs would be the focus of it. Because I've read everything that has already been approved for ARPA. And I think Bennett mentioned it earlier, even what he's seeing from the city, there's been nothing senior specific, nothing, nothing earmarked for senior programs for helping the service providers that service our community. And this would be our focus, is that this proposal would be for senior programs across Washtenaw County. And we would help everything from small programs up to large ones, whatever proposals were submitted. And then we would review and make those recommendations up to the Board of Commissioners. And so the ARPUC subcommittee unanimously supports drafting a senior priority fund proposal. That's our working title. Anybody has better word, uh, word smithing on that if it's approved. Um, we are very open to tweaking that out and have the proposal ready by mid May, April for submission to this whole committee for voting on approval and then sending to the board of, of commissioners. And um, if you do, find merit in this. I know we're going to have some discussion on it, but if you do find merit on it, we want to, the subcommittee wants to let you know that we have already put on our calendars, dedicated it just in case it gets approved to work over the next five weeks. Um, very hard to get this proposal done, to bring it back to you as the, to the full members so that we can look at and vote on it. But we are, we are really excited about this. And we think this is a a very good way we can um, put some of those ARPA monies towards senior proposals and, and supporting our whole com senior community. So I'll turn it back over to Marta. Okay, um, I have a whole lineup of people, but I'm gonna ask Peter to speak first because he's our county guru or whatever you wanna say he is. Yeah, and I, I'm sure uh, had Jason been able to attend today, this would have been part of his board of commissioners update. So I'm happy to give this part of the update. And uh, uh, just wanted to say like, uh, really interested in uh, what, what Bonnie just talked about. I'm excited to see what it ends up looking like if y'all work on this proposal more. Um, regardless of what you do, I do wanna highlight that this community priority fund, um, even if uh, you decide like, this isn't the exact proposal you wanna go with, the community priority fund for 48197 and 48198 has passed like it is it is real and there's an application portal going up on monday for mm -hmm. organizations and uh uh two of those five categories i know i know a few of them don't fit super well but uh if there are any uh, uh providers who are specifically working with seniors in 48197 uh, and 48198 doing work in the area of direct assistance 
or in the uh, addressing housing and homelessness space. Mm -hmm. Both of those are eligible categories for this. So I'm just going to uh, put in a plug here that if you are doing work in that area for seniors, you can apply for this fund and you don't have to wait for a potential one. So I just wanted to really highlight that, make it clear and encourage people uh, to uh, uh, look for the portal opening on Monday. There are technical assistance sessions for people interested in applying for this fund. Uh, so just wanted to make that clear. So if you know anybody who has a has a cool program going on in 48197 at 4 for seniors, that would fall under the community priority fund, regardless of what y'all end up doing. So just wanted to highlight that. Thank, Thank you. you. I see in, in order, I have Elizabeth, Dina, and then Stephen. I think it is such a wise idea that the subcommittee came up with to look at an existing structure where the um, infrastructure exists. Like Peter said, there's a portal for this other fund. There, so much of the work has already been done. I think that is a wonderful idea. I also really like the idea of making it very broad because from little projects and smaller providers to larger ones, because as we've heard before, sometimes um, it's difficult, especially in the more rural parts of the county or with entities like we've seen senior centers go from like the Ipsy Senior Center has part-time staff and volunteers to much richer uh, groups like the Turner Center. Um, this really opens it up for a lot of things. And Bennett's talked so powerfully about social isolation. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that some of that material about how that's affected seniors could definitely be included and I just think of, for example, the Ipsy Senior Center has a project with Eastern Michigan to have students who are, have some experience working with older adults, teach them on how to use some of these communication devices that have been so important, whether it's smartphone or Zoom and so on. It filled up immediately they didn't have the resources to expand it, continue it. That just hit me as one of those kind of little projects that could work. Plus we've also heard information about nutrition programs, how much that's been impacted mm -hmm. with the inability to do congregate meals. And um, I think this is a great direction to go. I'm highly supportive of it. Thank you. I have Dina and then Stephen. Hi, um, this may be a question for Peter, but um, maybe the committee also knows the answer. Uh, so I'm not that I get to vote, but I, I do think this is a great idea. Um, but I do have I'm just kind of raising maybe a little devil's advocate kind of points here. Um, do you think that the, the commissioner, the board of commissioners is going to want to fund something that is so similar to what they've already funded or will they want this to fall under the existing community priority fund that was just funded? Does anyone have any insight to that? Yeah, so, go ahead, Peter. <laughs> oh, I, I would say uh, county, the county government is a lean government. Like that's the model we use. So when when we can build off existing models that there's always willingness to do that. Um, and I think there would be interest. I don't wanna speak for any of the commissioners, but uh, building off of existing structures is usually something that's seen as a, as a plus. Um, like uh, if, if you have an existing structure and can add additional funds to continue to dis disperse in that way, if that, that way proves to be effective, that Duplicating like best practices has been, has been kind of a, a something that has been emphasized by the commissioners when possible in county administration as well. So I, I don't think that would dissuade them. I think it would just need need to uh, adequately make the case that there is there is need specifically for the ARPA funds in this way and being able to map those needs onto some of the uh, priority areas. I, I think there there is potential. I don't want to speak for any of them, but there is potential. 
Well, my impression here is that there's a pie. And, and so they have carved out already, you know, certain pieces of, of this pie, and there's just X amount left. So um, in order to be, to be, you know, um, broad in their, their priorities and covering a lot of needs, I just, I just wonder if it would be important for this group to get some guidance from Jason on what is the reality of carving out another piece of the pie for the same conceptually the same thing. Can I talk to that? I think it's worth mentioning. I have Stephen, then Bonnie, then Bennett, but I also want to say that the priority fund that was just approved was only for two zip codes, and there are many more zip codes in the county of Washtenaw. But there's a reason why they chose those two zip codes. I understand codes. that, and there's a good reason why they chose that, but I'm yeah. just saying. No, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not advocating that, that there isn't a need. I just, um, I'm just, I'm raising up that I, I think that there's sort of, it feels to me there's a there's a one shot opportunity here to ask for for funding and to not get it right, you know, could be a real like shame for the the older adult community. And I and I just wish that, you know, we could get some guidance from Jason on what are our actual like realistic uh, possibilities. I'm going to ask Bonnie to speak next because she's the one who authored this and uh, then Stephen and then Bennett and then we really have to move on because we're running short of time here. Well, I think that, first of all, the reason that we went with this model is because there is a senior need across the county. And this is the most effective and efficient way that we could find to earmark funds and then be able to look at everything from small to large projects specifically for seniors. The priority fund provides a structure, but if you look at the meat and potatoes of what it's for, it is only for two zip codes. There is nothing senior specific. If you are a senior provider, you can fall under two very narrow categories. So there has been nothing passed with ARPA for senior funds anywhere. And this was our idea of offering the most opportunity, the most funding that we could get across the county. I have already reached out to Jason. I've already sent him an email. I have asked him. Um, my subcommittee did ask me please to reach out to him because we did want to get his um, supporting guidance before we dedicated five weeks of work in putting a proposal together if it would not fly at the Board of Commissioners. So we have already done that. We are waiting for Jason's um, personal reply, I've got, like Peter has um, submitted some positive feedback on the structure that we're proposing is good. Everything's already going to be in place in the county. They don't have to reinvent the wheel. They're already going to have hired people in place. Websites are already put up. The process is going to be in place. What we have to do is make our compelling, our compelling pro, uh, proposal on why this is a good model what our needs are and our assessments are. And I'm very confident that all of the work that the different subcommittees are working on and also our service communities that participate on this, the information that they can provide, that we can put together a very compelling proposal to actually earmark some money for seniors. We're almost 16% um, of the population um, of Washtenaw County. And so far there hasn't been any ARPA money earmarked specifically for seniors. So we thought this was our best shot at the Apple, you know, at, at getting funding for seniors. So that's where, that's where we came from as a subcommittee rather than just supporting one thing. This doesn't preclude this whole commission. If there is a service organization that has, like Peter said, a proposal that they want to put forward under the priority fund, this doesn't preclude us from doing a letter of recommendation like we did for the infrastructure proposal. We can still do that, um, but we have five weeks basically to get together a good proposal. And we thought this was the most efe um, efficient, efficient way and our best shot at it. Okay, I have Stephen and then Bennett, and then we really will be moving ahead. Yeah, just a quick comment. I, I wanna support you know, what Elizabeth said about you know here, I know that there's gonna be a lot of money spent on broadband, but you know, one is there are a lot of people who one can't afford something like a tablet. Um, mm -hmm. And so that I think 
that's something to think about is how do we get in the hands of older adults mm -hmm. um, equipment so they can actually participate. And then as um, Elizabeth also mentioned, the training necessary for mm -hmm. people to use it. And it, it might even be one of the ways we get older adults involved in our Commission on Aging, because yeah. if we make it simple for them to um, attend, then they're, they're much more likely to be engaged and give us insights. Um, this is a question for Peter. Like I was under the impression that, uh, that ARPA funding had some, um, some role where they needed to ensure sustainability and that it was really more of something that would be used almost like a one-time thing and that there would be a need to follow up so that if we came up with a service and then there was no funding after a year or two years, then all of a sudden that's not what ARPA is about. It's about in some ways. So I, I wanted you to help us out in regards to, you know, what what even is happening with the 8 million in this community, you know, priority fund and also, you know, what our goals are and if that, that comment is true. Marta, I can answer in like 15 seconds. Uh, so yes, that is true in general. So like with this fund specifically, the $8 million is earmarked for one-time funding. So it's like a one-time infusion of cash to these organizations to both fund services and increase capacity to be able to expand those services moving forward. So it would be a one-time infusion of cash, um, which isn't always great for programming. Uh, sometimes it's better for infrastructure, but there is a place, so it would still be eligible, even though it's not like in an ideal world, you'd have funding beyond two or three years. But would there be criteria? Is there criteria used that would be, hey, tell me about the sustainability plan, and that would weigh in deci on decisions with this fund? Uh, not necessarily. We're still developing the scoring guidelines for it. Um, I'm sure that could be play an important role, and I'm, I'm guessing we'll have those conversations. And anytime something's sustainable, it's preferable. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, okay. Sustainable, uh, sustainability is a nice sounding term, and I've used it before. I mean, are we talking about strategies to attract uh, the interest of uh, the city council? Um, who have different objectives. Uh, they're thinking about investment in the city, the image of the city, and um, homelessness is a tertiary concern. So I don't know, Peter, do you, as I am going to approach my older woman after this meeting, do you have any suggestions for um, attracting her attention? Um, and I guess sustainability of a model city uh, also entails looking after uh, the parents uh, or grandparents and their well-being. I would say the county is always interested in partnering. So like if, if you want to point to some of these things that the county is thinking about and being like, hey, have you talked to them about partnering? That's always a good approach is saying, hey, reach out to the county to see if they'd be interested to partner because when we partner, we can do more and we can make it better. So uh, always suggest like, hey, have you, have you talked to the county about some of these ideas? This community priority fund seems like a good idea. What if we did something for other areas too. Okay, I think it's an uphill battle uh, with the city council. I'll do my best as a resident uh, advocate. I think another strategy would be if you're aware of a small organization like the one Elizabeth was mentioning that you think would really benefit from this um, community priority fund, I don't think it's wrong to contact them as an individual and just say, hey, have you heard about this? You know, can I help you? get this money. Okay. It's not wrong and please do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and with that in mind, uh, Peter, can you make sure that we all have the link to how to access these funds or how to apply to access these funds? Send it out to us. Thank you. Um, okay. So the next thing on the agenda is a motion on the ARPA subcommittee recommendation. Uh, and so I'll turn it back over to Bonnie. Yes. Um, I would like to make a motion. Um, to call for a vote for yes for approval or no for disapproval, that the Commission on Aging supports submitting an ARPA three round 
proposal and charges the ARPA subcommittee to draft a senior priority fund proposal and present it at one of the April 2022 COA full member meetings. Do we have a support? Support. Elizabeth? Yeah, support. Okay, Elizabeth has supported. Um, let's see, Elizabeth, did you have your hand up for another reason or was that why you had No, your... they just to support. And Bennett, did you have your hand up for another reason or no. did you forget to lower it? Okay. Um, all right, so now we have a motion on the floor and we have a support. Is there any discussion or have we already discussed it? I see Stephen's hand up. It, you know, there's just one other thought and I guess this might be a Peter question as well is, you know, we know that we have a good chance of applying for a millage as well. So there is a part of me, you know, in rethinking this, is there an opportunity for innovation by using ARPA Fund to pilot something over a year's time that could help inform us what would be an effective use of millage fund so that we, we do in fact allow for things in some ways that are innovative without sustainability clarity because that's what the millage is about is re regular funding for things that can have a great impact. So just wanted to mention that and I guess that Peter, what's your thoughts about that? Well, I would just interject that I think that we could refer that to the potential millage subcommittee for suggestions. But Peter, did you have anything to add to that? Uh, hard, to, hard to say, because I don't want to speak for any commissioner. But I think, uh, again, I think the, the more ideas and uh, conversations that are had are just like the better long term, because even if those specific ideas and thoughts don't move forward, it's still building that relationship. So I would recommend like, uh, considering it and using that as a talking point when you talk to uh, various commissioners, whether it's Jason or the person who represents you. So I think always bringing those ideas, even if they are individual ideas, is a good thing and will like strengthen the relationship between the commission and the board. Okay, um, Bennett, do you mean to have your hand up or did you just forget to take it down? I thought I took it down, sorry. Any other discussion before we have a, a vote? Seeing none, I'll ask Stephanie to call the roll. Thank you. Um, okay, so Marta Larson? Yes. Marie Gress? Yes. Bonnie Weber? Yes. Elizabeth Thompson? Yes. Ellen Offen? <laughs> I see that her head is shaking, yes. Yep, I got that. <laughs> Steve Stein? Yes. Okay, Bennett Stark. Yes. And Margaret Reynolds. Yes. Okay, that passes. Um, I would suggest uh, Stephanie, and I will also take this into account that um, when Ellen gets called on, one of us, does, you know, unmute her uh, so that it's easier for her since she's having difficulty accessing the. I can ask her to unmute. I just can't physically unmute her, but I, I, I do prompt to ask to unmute. So sometimes that works. Yeah, that would be helpful. Okay. That just probably will just increase the anxiety issue, but who knows? <laughs> um, okay, so the motion passes and uh, we'll wait to hear from the ARPA subcommittee on that. Next discussion item um, relates to um, goals, expectations and guidelines for the commission members and um, for officers and for subcommittees. Uh, one of the things that uh, the officers discussed when we were sort of making the transition from Gary's leadership to mine is um, the, the possible use of outlined goals, expectations, and guidelines. We've been operating as a commission for less than a year, uh, which it seems like it's been a lot longer than that, but <laughs> less than a year. Uh, so we're basically still a newborn commission, but uh, part of what we've learned is that everybody on the commission may have different ideas about what it is we're trying to accomplish and what expectations are. And this is true of any organ organized group that's a commission, a committee, a board, or whatever. So the officers thought that it might be a good idea to have a discussion about uh, some of these issues. So we divided it into three sets of discussions. One is about officers, one is about everyone on the commission, and one is about subcommittees. And I'm looking at the time and it's 12 after 10 already. So I'm not sure we're gonna have time to get through all of this, but we're gonna make our best shot at it. 
And if necessary, we can put it to the next meeting to finish. So you all should have received a copy, a written copy of what we came up with. And these are meant to be starter for the discussion, not dictation. So um, what we would like to know is how you all feel about some of these uh, goals. Let's start with the goals for officers. Um, what is it that the officers should be trying to accomplish? What are the expectations we have of officers? And what are the guidelines that might be offered to officers? Does anybody have any thoughts about any of these things or, that were offered, uh, additions, edits, um, or any other discussion? I see thumbs up from Margaret. Does anyone disagree with any of these? Wow, that was easy. <laughs> uh, okay, let's move ahead to the commissioners then. Um, again, we have a set of goals, expectations and guidelines for everyone on the Commission on Aging. Um, and so I'm interested, and again, does anyone have any suggestions, edits, additions? <clears throat> Uh, Bonnie, I see your hand up. Yes. Um, under, I understand it's goals, and it's it's a it's a very difficult challenge. We hear it repeatedly um, throughout, you know, our meetings is to good communications with your county commissioner on a regular basis. I know some of you have county commissioners that respond. Others have county commissioners that don't respond. So. It's 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 a good goal and and I don't I mean, what do you recommend if you you communicate out and you get absolutely no feedback back? Um, you know I mean that's you know we we face this on a couple of levels you know with with communication you know you don't know if no news is good news and you know if they you know if you're doing something well they're just saying you know great fine you know full speed ahead but. Um, it, um, I, I have found it a challenge. So um, I don't know if others have had the same experience on finding a challenge. I know I'm going to, you know, once we work on this, our proposal, it's going right to, you know, I'm going to send an email back out to my commissioner and say, this is what we're working on. This is, you know, I'd like your feedback on it, but I don't know if I'll get a response back. So that's just the kind of caveat that I know that's a goal. Some of us may um, be able to achieve that easily um, easier than others. So, um, it was just my comment on that one. Okay. And Elizabeth, I see your hand is up. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> to Bonnie's point, um, at least if we've given the information, um, we've done our part. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm wondering, we said regularly attend meetings and again, Peter might have information if there's an expectation that already exists on a, in the county of number of excused absences permitted or something like that. Sometimes uh, we've all been tremendous about attending all the meetings, but uh, those here, but sometimes there are members who don't, and I don't know if we should address that specifically in terms of number of meetings, maybe the county already has something related to other commissions about attendance. I would say that our bylaws say that if you have more than two unexcused absences, you will be put off. Yes, so that deals with it. Thank you for reminding me. Um, but that does not address how many excused absences. Uh, and an excused absence is defined as contacted the county, in this case, the person of Peter, and said, I'm not going to be able to attend the meeting, and here's why. And then that's considered an excused absence. <clears throat> I do know that we have one member who is having some health issues, and I, I believe that may be what's happening there. Yeah. So it, it sounds like my concern has already been addressed. To some degree, yes. Bonnie, did you have anything to add to yeah, that? Yeah, I just wanted to comment on that as, as um, working on this as well. We have it in the bylaws what the process is for removing somebody. It's just 
when do you make that decision as a commission to act upon it? We were, okay. trying, to, we're trying to work through this on various, various avenues, communicating various ways. So it's not like we're not doing anything. Um, it's just a very delicate and difficult situation um, to get to get some activity coming from the board of commissioners on this. So we're hoping that we can get this resolved and 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 move forward on it. Okay, Margaret, did you have something to add? Uh, well, I was kind of wondering um, what the difference was between expectations and guidelines in each of these categories. Uh, I maybe not enough. I don't know. <laughs> well, um, the you know, as I read them, I thought expectations are really required activities and guidelines are maybe a little looser, but but maybe not. I mean, some of them uh, seem to be in the guidelines, like inviting. Uh, organizations and community members probably ought to be an expectation. I think they're kind of blurred. Um, Maybe we should add it and just you, you remove the word guidelines in all cases and just have it all be expectations. Well, I, as I looked at them, I thought that might fit. Um, I do want to point out that there, there is deliberate language in here using the words collaboratively and individually. Uh, and yeah. I don't know if that was real clear to everyone, but collaboratively is something that the entire commission is responsible for doing. Um, and individually means that individual members of the commission may do the following. So I don't know if that was clear in the draft. Bonnie? Yeah, um, I, I'm sure that up on the officers part, and then it's going to come down when we get down to the subcommittees, but the bullet uh, part where um, the guideline is at least one officer on each subcommittee. So do we want to make that a guideline that there is one officer on each subcommittee or do we want to have that be that that's a requirement the expectation is there will be so that's that's kind of how I did it, you know, are we going to say that that's that's the expectation that there will be an officer on every subcommittee, or is it going to be a guideline that we would like that to happen, but it's not. So that kind of how I differentiated the difference between expectation and guideline on that bullet with the officers, and then it'll be down in the subcommittee as well. Are we going to make that, you know, so that, that, that kind of was my distinction between them. But do, would you object to just removing the word guidelines and have them all subsumed into a, a, into expectations, uh, Bonnie? I would. I would if there's no objections. If you if you don't think that that the um, under the guidelines, if it's too strict, I would just roll it under expectations. But if you think there's wiggle room or it, you might not always be able to achieve that, then it would be a guideline. Mm -hmm. Stephen, you well, I. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Margaret, go ahead and finish. Um, well, I, I'm not objecting really. Um, I'm just asking for clarification. And if we wanna try it this way, goals, expectations, guidelines, I'm perfectly happy with that to give it a try and see if that helps helps us. Um, so I'm, I'm really not objecting. I just kind of wanted some clarification. Mm -hmm. And I think in any board or commission, if you have something like this in existence, you should revisit it periodically. So mm, yeah. I think we should put this on the agenda for maybe sometime in, I don't know, maybe October, November, somewhere in that range to revisit and say, how's this working or do we need to re-edit? Uh, Stephen, you had something and then Bonnie. Yeah, just, uh, I actually um, think there is benefit for not having an expectation that the officer has to sit on every subcommittee. Um, I think for two reasons. One would be is um, in fairness to officers that they don't have to be on, um, you know, spend that many extra hours because I know just being an officer is very time intensive. Um, and then I think the other thing is that it is helpful for um, there not to be sometimes an officer involved so that there is um, you know, free flowing 
um, conversation in which others are empowered to take leadership despite the fact they're not an officer. So, you know, my tendency would be um, not to make that an expectation of an officer. Okay, thank you. And then Bonnie? Um, so this, of, of all of the things that we have, um, that we've outlined, this is the, I think this is the issue on where if an officer serves or doesn't serve on each subcommittee, because under the subcommittee expectations is that there will be at least one officer on. There. If we go with it as a guideline, the only thing as an officer that, that I would strongly suggest that um, Marie kind of touched on in the communications portion is that before you do a reach out to the community, before you do any contact with the community, sending out a letter, meeting them in person, calling them on the phone, whatever your subcommittee decides, if there isn't an officer already serving, that you have to communicate to the officer so we know what's going on. Because if there is an issue, if there's a concern, if there's a complaint, if there's confusion, they jump right over you guys and come right to the officers and we would be blindsided. We would not know if there wasn't an officer on the committee. I'm fine with an, not having an officer on the committee if the subcommittees that don't have an officer on there, you know, know that that is an expectation before they do that reach out into the community. They just give us a heads up on what you're doing so we don't get caught in the crossfires, which we have been. So this is, this is coming from experience. It's not coming from a, you know, what if, it, it's something that has already happened. Okay, um, Stephen. Um, yeah, hi, um, I think a couple of things. One is I support that Bonnie 100% that that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, the other thing I guess I would um, wonder about to make kind of at least a guideline if not an expectation is Marie's comment from last meeting about having a member of the community part of subcommittees and that that should be an expectation that either a service provider or an older adult um, gives the subcommittees that, that that's a place for more community involvement. How about if we add to um, maybe guidelines that you know, where possible members of the public can be invited or something like that. That sounds great, that sounds great. I think that is. I think that's in the guidelines under subcommittees already. It is. It's already okay. in there. Sorry, I missed that. Thank it's you. In there. Okay. I'm not sure it actually made it into the final edited document. Um, so it's, um, Last bullet, isn't it? Last bullet. Yeah. yeah, yeah, there it is. Yeah, you're, you're right. I see it. So, um, Bennett, you have your hand up? Well, I am not sure that I got these expectations. And I'm wondering whether another, um, if you will, uh, piece of literature dealing with it. So, uh, from, I guess that would be Stephanie. Okay. Uh, now, uh, when I reach, I've already said that I've reached out to an older woman, um, and I may reach out to the city um, housing commission of Lurie Terrace. Now I am. <clears throat> now, if I do that, um, and let's say I'm speaking to, well, I've already told Erica that I am a. Uh, you know, a member of the commission. You know, if there is a discussion and it is in any way uh, fruitful, I, I would say that I am on the commissioner. I am on the commission. Now, is that um, is that necessary uh, to do? I think it is, from what um, has been discussed. I think the intent is is that if you are speaking to someone, either. Uh, elected official or a member of the public as a representative of the Commission on Aging or a subcommittee on the Commission on Aging, um, that you would need to let the officers know before you do that so that we can um, react if there should be any feedback. Okay, well, I mean, um, I haven't, well, I'm telling you and I said, okay, um, I mentioned in the meeting that I had reached out to uh, Erica Briggs, who is the uh, 
an older woman, okay? Now, is that sufficient for that? Well, that would be retrospective notification. So it's a start. Okay. <laughs> but okay, so I think whenever um, your conversation with someone starts out with I'm on the Commission oh, on Aging or I'm on a subcommittee of the Commission on Aging, that's what this is applying to. Okay, well, it could well have. So um, you can look at that uh, as um, my being ignorant of um, I didn't notify the Commission, okay, or an officer. Now, if in fact I do speak with the Housing Commissioner, who I've spoken to about other matters. Um, um, with, so I am asking for permission to do that. Well, you, you don't need our permission as long as you're speaking as an individual. So if you leave the Commission on Aging out of it, which is not necessary in order for you to be an individual citizen to communicate with either the Housing Bureau or the City well, Council. Well, one of the questions I would have <laughs> is, why hasn't the city uh, done anything uh, regarding help, uh, helping uh, the hundreds of people uh, that the city owns their dwelling places? Mm -hmm. um, and but I'm thinking to you, Bennett, that you don't need to identify the Commission on Aging as part of that question. You can just ask that question. That's what as, I a, mean, as an individual citizen. Oh, OK. So well, if she does know. doesn't come up, then it's not pertinent to us and it's none of our business. Okay. Okay. Um, got it. Thank you. But I would like another statement of that, um, of that expectation guideline. It came out with the meeting packet with your agenda. So if you have the agenda, it was in that same packet. Well, I think I don't have the complete packet. packet. Well, they were all in the same email, so. Okay, I'll look for it. Thank you. Um, okay, so now we have five minutes to go here. So the question is, if we move the number one guideline for officers up under expectations so that the uh, one stay informed on subcommittee work by assuring there's at least one officer on each subcommittee, that one would be moved to expectations as opposed to guidelines. Is there any other amendments that are needed or are we feeling this is acceptable? And if people think it's acceptable, I'll take a motion. Oh, I see Peter's hand up or Steven's hand up, sorry. Yeah, no, I, I just want to say that, um, you know, my tendency would be to support it being, you know, um, more optional and not an expectation. Um, but I can just vote on that. Okay, does anybody have a motion to make? <clears throat> I, make a motion. I make a motion that we have that, um, that there is one officer on a subcommittee. No, I'm asking for a motion on whether to adopt the um, goals, expectations, and guidelines that were presented at the meeting today and discussed with that one amendment of moving that one individual item under expectations as opposed to guidelines. All right, I make the motion that we support that. Do we have a second? I second that motion. That would be Elizabeth. Is there any more discussion? Peter, is your, or Stephen, is your hand just up accidentally? I guess it was accidental since it disappeared. <laughs> Good move. Uh, and Bonnie, is your hand up accidentally? Oh, or? Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. So do we need a roll call on this or can this be a affirmation vote? I don't know. Answer to that question. Peter, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it can be an affirmation. I don't think you have to do a roll call vote, but Peter, correct me. So if it's, if you're, you, since it's an official motion, you do have to do a, a roll call vote solely because online, that's one of the provisions to stay in remote is every vote has to be roll call except the call to adjourn. Okay. okay. So we'll have a roll call, Stephanie. Okay. Margo Larson? Yes. Marie Grest? Yes. Bonnie Weber? Yes. Elizabeth Thompson? Yes. Ellen Offen? Yes. Uh, Steve Stein? No. Okay. Bennett Stark? Yes. 
Margaret Reynolds. Yes. Motion passes. Okay, thank you, everybody. All right, um, we're gonna do the rest of this in, in speed format here. <laughs> we have the 2022 meeting calendar on the agenda. I propose that we just set up the next meeting, which is identified as March 18th at 8.30 and uh, take up the issue of the calendar at that point. Um, it's best practice to have a, a year long meeting calendar. So I think we'll bring that up then. Under report from the chair, um, I am tentatively scheduled to, to present our report to the Board of Commissioners on April 6th. We may have to push that back to make sure that we have the needs assessment information and possibly the ARPA proposal ready by that time, but that's our tentative date. Um, we added an item to the agenda that you may have noticed called potential future topics. So we have periodically members bringing up, we should talk about this, we should talk about that at a future meeting. And this is now the place where those are gonna be listed. So you can see where the, what's in the parking lot, so to speak. Uh, some of those things may be grabbed up by various subcommittees who can say, yes, we're gonna take that on and we don't need to have an immediate discussion. The subcommittee is gonna start with it and then we'll get back to you. And some of them may end up being scheduled, but this is where the officers will look to uh, try to organize future meetings. Um, I think our next meeting is gonna be working on the needs assessment information, I suspect. Um, so um, our next meeting is scheduled for March 18th at 8.30 a.m. And then our next one after that is probably gonna be April 1st if we stick to the pattern we've been following, which will, um, um, I would like to suggest that written reports that were given at this meeting be added to the minutes as an addendum so that they're included in, in information that goes out to the public with the um, edit on the uh, goals, expectations and guidelines that one point get moved up to the expectations as opposed to guidelines. Does anybody else have anything? We have half a minute to go here. Thank you for the work on the goals, expectations and guidelines. I think that's so helpful. The officers worked on it quite, a, quite, quite hard. Okay, so that being said, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Somebody raise I'm, their hand and wave their arms. I'm Marie, make that Marie. motion. And I see Marjorie as, as, as uh, Margaret has seconded it. All those in favor, no, we have a motion, so we have to do a roll call. Not to adjourn. Not, Not to adjourn. Not to adjourn, okay. All those in favor, say hi, say yes or wave your hands. Yes. Aye. Looks like a unanimous uh, vote. So we'll see everyone on March 18th at 8.30. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.